This is the Anything Goes with Jackson Neal podcast. Welcome back to the podcast, here for episode number 133. I'm Jackson Neal. Today's guest, Elizabeth and the Catapult, caught up with her when she came through Philadelphia on her recent tour. Before we jump into that conversation, I want to remind everyone that this podcast is available on all of your favorite platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, SoundCloud, basically wherever you like to listen. Make sure to subscribe so you get the new episodes every single Tuesday and Thursday. So Elizabeth recently was just on tour. Uh, when she came through Philadelphia, she was at World Cafe Live, and I sat down with her, and I wanted to talk to her about you know, some of her past music, how this current tour is going, and all of that. She told some pretty interesting stories, including one right off the bat about this time she was given a brownie before a show, and there might have been something in there that she wasn't so sure uh, was in there before she had it, and led to an interesting performance, let's just call it. So she talks about that, some music that she's currently working on and plans to release, coming up. So, with all that, let's jump right into this conversation. How are you doing right now? I'm good. This is like the second night of tour now. Well, not like, this is the second night of tour. And I woke up so excited at 7 a.m. for no reason (laughs) after we got back from trying to find parking at like 2 a.m. So, I would say I'm in a happy daze. Well, you're in that, like, tour just started. I'm looking forward to it. I'm not completely (laughs) dead yet. Um, Actually, I feel like I just gave myself a taste of what the end of tour is going to feel like (laughs) on my schedule today. But, yeah, I'm good. Otherwise, I mean, I love Philly, and I always love playing here. I have a fan who always brings me cookies, and I really appreciate cookies. Oh, what kind of cookies? I mean, they're different every time. Oh, that's... But they're, like, not... There's no substance in them. Okay. Which is important. (laughs) Because once at an Amy Mann show, when I was opening for Amy Mann, someone gave me a weed cookie. Oh my god, really? And I didn't know, and it affected my performance. These are totally normal cookies. I mean, like, if you took a, if you had an edible before you went on, you weren't expecting that. I bet, like, it is criminal. I bet, like, mid set, there was just a little bit of a. Supposedly, I slurred six or seven songs into four minutes. At one point, that's what one of my fans said. They were like, well, you did the most extraordinary thing. I'm like, keep calling it extraordinary. I was going to say, extraordinary, I guess. You know, I guess they could have said worse words, right? Well, I guess everyone... That's a good intro. We have yeah. a good intro. Oh, that was, that was a, people are going to be so hooked into this interview. They can't stop listening at this point, right? I don't know if you can top that. I don't think so. So I want to get into some of the music you're playing. You're playing your record Keepsake on this project, on this tour, right? Yeah, yeah, that and, and any new music. There'll be a couple covers. When I tour solo, I can basically just pick from any of my hundreds of songs. So mm-hmm. I just have fun and try to be spontaneous about it on the day. Gotcha. So you said right there, I guess, I guess new music. What have you been working on recently? Well, I was working on a TV show actually for the last four months. I was like a music consultant for Sarah Bareilles' new TV show. I don't know if I'm even allowed to talk about this, but I think she said something about it on the gram. So now I feel better, but she has a new TV show coming out and I helped with that. Um, So I wasn't doing as much of my own music, but I have been, I like like playing out. Mm -hmm. So I'm so hungry to play out now, I'm so excited. But uh, I was recording like solo, like I'm trying to get, do a compilation of all, all my saddest songs. Okay. <laughs> for the winter and put it out. Um, so I have a lot of like dark ballads that I'm working on. So I want to go to that. How, I guess, how do you get involved with the TV show? I want to kind of start there. Cause that's a, it's a pretty big project. Well, I don't think we can talk about it, okay. honestly. <laughs> okay, if we can't talk about it, then I mean, no problem. I'm, gonna, I'm a jerk for bringing it up and then saying no, because I sound like it's just a, just a, at least a diva, at least that. Oh, I mean, it's, it's just like a, it's like a humble brag, I would say. It's a humble know? brag. So, oh man, my hair, my friend Harris made up that word. Harris Whittles, he was a great comic. But oh. anyway, um, <laughs> humble brag. Oh, really? I didn't um, so yeah, he coined the term 10 years ago. But uh, so you, you can't talk, yeah. can't talk about that. Well, I just know that there's a TV show coming out with, with Sarah's music and I toured a lot with her. Um, uh, many years ago, she just like found my music out of the blue and took me on, on the road. And now she kind of reaches out and she's doing different projects. So 
like I helped with some string arrangements for her musical waitress and mm -hmm. she just kind of always throws me a bone. It's very sweet. Wow, yeah, just kind of, you know, collaborate a little bit every yeah. once in a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this, this this sad music you have coming out. Yeah. Why did you want to, why do you decide to release sad music, I guess, now as a compilation of your saddest songs? Well, I think that I did this thing, which is, you know, I was on a major label for a couple records and then I had uh, a couple, uh, one record on my own and now I'm on another label. But I still feel like I always feel the pressure to, to like, be, do something a little, like at least have my singles be a little commercial. Okay. And I think I do it subconsciously. Like I don't want to, I want it to be a good song, mm -hmm. but I want it to be uplifting somehow. Okay. I want people to feel good with it. So I just literally forget about all of my sadder ballads because I don't get, leave space for them mm -hmm. to Can also be in the mix. And so I have so many forgotten ballads. Oh my God, that's the name. A forgotten ballad. Cool. Is that is that the name now? I guess that's the name of the album. That's a pretty cool name to have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. <laughs> so wait, that's so you so you you subconsciously think like maybe you want, this should, this should be more commercially viable is when you create a song. I don't. I just I th think my singles ended up being more commercially viable or just at least uplifting. Mm -hmm. And when I'm when I end up having like I'll just record like you know. 15, 16 songs for an album or more. And then you pick the ones that are gonna be on the album. And usually the ones that are a little bit more uplifting just went out, I don't know why. Yeah. I usually like squeeze in a couple. Um, I do like the juxtaposition between really happy sounding music and really dark lyrics. Mm -hmm. So that exists a lot. Okay. It's so just like, yeah, I know. And then in a weird way, talking about sad or happy music is just like, it is, it's just sounds too like ubiquitous or it just sounds, mm -hmm. it's just a little bit of a dim okay. conversation I'm <laughs> creating. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, <laughs> but like, but I just, just to say maybe like the slower songs. Okay. Yeah. So you would say this is almost kind of like a, I don't want to say passion project, but something like you feel like yeah. you, it's just something kind of for you. This is, bit. yes, <laughs> yes. And, and there are fans of mine out there that, that like all the sappy stuff, like mm -hmm. it's weird, but um, actually, um, this song of mine, Thank You For Nothing, which really was, this, I think, this, the sappiest song I ever wrote. Mm -hmm. um, Anne Hathaway really liked, and she had me play it in this movie that she was in. Oh, wow. Um, and in a scene where, like, I'm supposed to be making her cry by playing it <laughs> on the subway. And so it was like, play your saddest song, and I played that. So I think there's always an audience for everything. Mm -hmm. But I do think that this is like, this is this is yeah this is also for me this is okay it's your release for you yeah. so how many how many songs do you think you're gonna put on there how many tracks are you looking at right now i mean if i had it my way i would have like 25 tracks per album but um usually things are whittled down by the powers that be mm -hmm. to like you know 10 or 12. also if you want to fit it on a vinyl mm -hmm. so. there you go well um I kind of want to go back to that keepsake project because I have a couple questions yeah, from that. Sure. Um, just can you tell, tell me a little bit about like the recording process for that? How long did you spend on that project? Hmm. I'm trying to remember. We recorded it at Panorama Studios in San Francisco on the ocean, the most beautiful studio I've ever been to. There were literally like sea lions and walruses <laughs> out the window. So we recorded the bulk of it there, and then I recorded some of it um, back in New York, um, some overdu overdubs and stuff. But I think it was like probably over the course of you know you 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 record an album and you think it's completely done, and then you could really fiddle with it uh -huh. over the rest of your life. <laughs> do, you but, feel, do you feel like give yourself like a cutoff date? Like, okay, I'm gonna like. We had stop. a cutoff date, and that's why it came out when it came out. Because <laughs> it was finally time to stop so, fiddling. But um, but yeah. So so in a, in a weird way, this one, when I have time to do it, is is more about like not fiddling with anything mm -hmm. and just capturing the moment. Is that so? Is that very stripped down? Very stripped down. Yeah. So. So I guess it's fiddling with an album is something that you do a lot. I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna guess. So does it maybe feel a little? What if 
Is it restricting or do you find it like freeing, I guess, to like say, I'm not gonna fiddle with this one, I'm just gonna release it. Freeing. Freeing, really. It's wonderful. Just like, oh, I can just finally release it just how this sounds and not have well, to worry about like. The way, yeah, yeah, the way that I remember my songs or else I would forget songs day to day that I write mm -hmm. is I rec I immediately videotape them and put them on online on Facebook and that's how I've kept my fans because they've heard all of my new songs exactly when I wrote them usually okay. like day or day after oh wow um so I always have a record so if I'm like what was that song about being bored with my son wait did I write that song and then I'll just like <laughs> go back my history and I'll be like there it is from six months ago oh and that person told me I should call it something else I, I will take note, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Um, actually, me and Julia have that in common that we both are really interactive with our fans online and share a lot of music online. You, I just got yeah. done talking with her about the whole, like, you know, Patreon and like Kickstarter mm -hmm. and like how wild it is nowadays that you can just engage yeah. with your fans like that. Mm -hmm. And like even a time like she was saying, she had two years where she didn't release anything. Mm -hmm. She still kept everybody engaged by mm -hmm. posting updates on that. Yeah, and I had. Um, I had, I think I made demos, like I I actually play in, in the subway. Uh, whenever I have my shit together, <laughs> I go play in the subway because it's the best place for me to kind of warm up because it sounds like a church, it's amazing. And it's got, and it, that's where I learned guitar because you okay. have to like really work for it down there. Like mm -hmm. your fans aren't there, they don't want to listen to you and you have to like work for it. Okay. And so it's a great place for performers to go. I have my friends come down and do that with me all the time. So you do it but, down in the subway, like in, yeah. in New York? Yeah, and I even have a song about it. But I recorded all, I took all of those videos and I took the the sound recordings from them and I just compiled them and it was like a list of like, literally something like 45 or 50 songs. Mm -hmm. And I just gave them all away to my, um, well it was Pledge Music, but <laughs> Pledge Music is no more. But all, basically like all my, my patrons yeah, okay yeah when did you start doing stuff down in the sub i mean i just find that so interesting when did you start like performing down in the subway i think it was like five years ago or something mm -hmm. i just i just realized that i was um that i really wanted to learn guitar but i, I didn't want to do it i think mostly it's about being around people in a okay. weird way because so much of your life as like a writer and a composer and a songwriter is alone mm -hmm. just writing and mulling things over so i kind of wanted to learn in front of people if that makes any sense i just yeah. wanted to be around people while i was shedding mm -hmm. and it's a perfect place to do it because no one's really bothering you but sometimes they give you money <laughs> that is nice yeah <laughs> so when you perf whenever my fans see me though they freak out i'm like everyone calm down <laughs> They're like, why are you playing on the subway? <laughs> yes, I was going to say, because I can, I can just picture, you know, I'm a fan of your music and just like seeing you on the subway, I'd be like, Whoa. Well, when I played Madison Square Garden with Sarah Bruss, I warmed up in the subway before the show. Really? Sorry. Actually, the cops kicked me out of the subway before the show. They kicked you out. <laughs> Did you tell them, oh, I'm performing at Madison Square? I, I may have muttered it. It's a ter That's a humble brag. But they didn't, did not care. <laughs> oh my God. And that's the beauty of life, man, the juxtaposition, you know? Yeah, exactly. Just going from the big stage, yeah. from the subway to the yeah. big stage. Yeah. So on that record, Keepsake, you, you had a couple collaborations. You had a couple guests on that record that you mm -hmm. worked with. Why did you decide on those collaborations? Okay. Name me which ones you're talking about. Okay. That's probably it. Um, crap, I forgot to write these ones down. Shit. Um, okay, well, there was Richard Swift. Yeah, that was the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. past. Um, he's a dear friend, and it's terribly upsetting but um he did some tracks um then uh pete and danny play on all my records they are in the band lucius i played with them for seven years my band mm -hmm. so we just always do records together um i don't know there must be my friend staying on it i don't know i don't know i, I, I was just kind of wondering Rob like Moose did the string arrangements he does Amazing arrangements for everyone. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you mentioned going down to the subway and like being in front of people, because a lot mm -hmm. of times as a creative, you're just alone. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of get in that idea of like, when you go to collaborate with someone, yeah. what is it that you look for in that person that says, oh, I want to collaborate with this person. Or, I want to work with this person. Well, they're usually people I just came up with. You know? Okay. Like I just like grew up with those guys. Like I went to college with those guys. Okay. But with Swift, actually, um, they say you have to kill your idols. <laughs> But I like just felt, just felt like when I met him, 
I was such a huge fan that my belt popped off onto him. Oh, really? I know that doesn't even sound possible, mm-hmm. but I was wearing this American Apparel belt and it just popped onto him. And he was like, okay, <laughs> that is... what an interesting way to meet someone. And I was like, oh my God, uh, I'm the biggest fan. Because uh, uh, he produced all my favorite artists and I'm a huge fan of his songwriting. And um, and he was like, and so we started talking. This was backstage at a Bright Eyes show. He was like, well, send me your best song. So actually I sang, sent him Thank You For Nothing. Mm-hmm. And he got right back to me. He was like, I want to make a record with you. And then he joined the Shins and the Black Keys and was like on tour for like two years when I finally got some songs with him. Finally got on this record. Finally got to yeah. collaborate yeah, and sit down. <sighs> that whole thing is, yeah. yeah. We all miss him very much. Well, so you tonight's your second show of your current tour. You're yes. still 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 going strong, even yeah. though maybe woke up a little early. I guess just just ha- you have this these sad, the forgotten ballads coming yes. at, coming yes. out this winter. Ooh, just how are you feeling right now? Now, like at the end versus the beginning of the interview, how am I feeling now? Yeah, I guess I'll just say yeah, like I looking forward. I feel like forward, I've made a journey. Just, I feel like I made a journey and I'm feeling a little more energetic. Like I've had like a quarter of a Coca-Cola. Oh, there you go. That's what it feels like. Well, <laughs> if you can if you can look forward and think you know, I'm a quarter of Coca-Cola, as long as, as long as you're not eating an edible before your set tonight, I think you'll be all right. Oh, hell no, I'll never do an edible. For the record. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm looking, forward, I'm looking forward to the rest of the tour. I have some exciting stuff coming up, and that I can't talk about either, which is so not helpful for an interview. But you know, I'm excited for the projects that are coming in the future. There you go. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Again, a big thank you to Elizabeth for coming on to the podcast. Remember, go down into the show notes on whatever platform you're listening on. There I'll have links so you can check out her music as well as follow her online for any future releases or shows that she might be playing coming up. With that, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the Anything Goes with Jackson Yo podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, make sure to subscribe and rate this show on your favorite platforms. New episodes every single Tuesday and Thursday. For more episodes of this podcast, as well as my other podcasts, go over to jacksonyopodcast.com for the full archives. If you're a big fan of this show, maybe consider becoming a subscriber over on Patreon. Over there, for just a couple dollars a month, you can get access to cool bonus content for my interviews here on Anything Goes, where I ask other kinds of questions. So make sure to go over to Patreon and check that out. I write, record, and produce these episodes as a full-time college student all by myself, so any little bit of support just helps me spend more time making these episodes. If you want to stay up to date on anything I'm doing, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at jacksonneal 20 Today's music is by Analog by Nature with their song CDK Sunday. Thanks again for listening. I'll see you all next time.